Welcome to Long Game, where we sit down with some of the most prolific athletes in pro sports to talk about legacy. My dad told me that I was going to be bigger, stronger, I was going to hit more home runs than him. I didn't believe it. You were just all gas, no brakes. It's just expectation and standard. My dad was like, sports ain't the thing, son. You're just wasting your time. What do you want your legacy to be? If I'm just known as a fighter, I think. And not just legacy under the bright lights, but in all aspects of their life, family, and business. Behind the bright lights, fighters are suffering. Basketball is not my penalty. I came from an environment that breed champions. We worked with Dame, and we saw Dame every day. Everything you heard about him, that's what it is. My team here knows I want you to be great. If you're going to be mediocre, I don't want to be around you. Why is giving back so impactful for you? Why do I do it? Because somebody did it for me. We'll uncover how these athletes continue to make a lasting impact. This is Long Game. On today's episode of Long Game, I'm headed to Indianapolis to visit a WNBA great and four-time Olympic gold medalist. Catchings all the way to the hoop. Tamika Catchings was born in New Jersey to a basketball family. Her father, Harvey Catchings, played in the NBA. The Catchings, Harvey drives and gets an easy one. After moving to Illinois when she was young, Tamika led both her basketball and volleyball teams to state championships. Tamika, first of all, thank you for being here with Long Game. Uh, usually, I like to jump into our questions, but I want to ask you first, why did you choose this place to have this conversation? Wow, that's a good question. Well, this is my home, Indianapolis, just in general. But when I bought this tea shop, it really signifies so much in my life. Uh, we moved around when I was younger. My father played in the NBA. So we moved around a lot, but tea was the thing that brought our family together. And I brought this right after I retired. And I love it. I mean, I, I love the atmosphere. I love the people. How about the name, Tease Me? Like, it's like it's a pun. Perfect. <laughs> it, Is that a part of your personality or something? Like, how do we get into it? That was the name of it. Got I it. bought it. I actually yeah, yeah. bought it from the previous owner. And Tease Me, it just, it's a fun name. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a fun it name. Is. It's one that you will forever remember. Absolutely. No matter absolutely, where you are absolutely. in the world, you remember. It's you actually, remember. actually pretty brilliant, uh, Tease Me. I mean, so you're not from Indianapolis. You're not from Indiana. You did play here for 16 years. Why is this the place that you felt like you're just going to settle and put your roots down? I've been here. I've been here longer than anywhere else in my life. Like I said we moved around a lot. So literally, when people ask me where am I from, I claim Chicago and Dallas. I was born in New Jersey. I went to Tennessee from there, but we moved around a lot. My father played Milwaukee, New Jersey Nets, Philadelphia 76ers, and the Clippers. So, and then he played overseas for a year, and then we moved to Texas, and then we moved to Illinois. That's back like to an Texas. army brat. So like a, here like we are. army kid, like so, all over the place. So I'm here. Right. And I mean, it's kind of one of those places. I got here, I was hurt my first year, and the community really just put their arms around me. And so like, I, I'm a loyal person. But when I love, I love hard, yeah. and I love, I love being here. And it, and it shows, it does. You talk about your dad, and let's transition to him a little bit. And um, how was that growing up in a household where your father was an NBA player? It was fun, you know. But I think you don't understand what it really is like, right? It's just it's part of your life. You don't think of. I didn't think I was different than anybody else because this is all I knew. People ask like, what do you remember about? just the time with your dad. I remember Sunday nights. Sunday, every Sunday night, first when we were in Chicago, my dad had the keys to the gym, and we would go and have open gym, and my dad would spend about an hour just training with my brother, my sister, and I, and then the older guys would come, and he would play, get, you know, play pickup. And I remember as a girl, I would be so mad because I wanted to play with the guys. <laughs> and my brother, he got to play with the guys, but my, my dad wouldn't let me play. And so I just remember all the time just saying, like, Dad, I'm getting good enough. Like, I'm good enough to play with the guys. Oh, man. And yeah, fast forward, here we are. So, he, so basically, he was just that, right? Yeah. It was just that, and, and it was an experience that you couldn't, really couldn't really understand until you got as an adult. And I think, and I shared with you earlier on, I have two people in my household that um, have hearing impairments. You and your brother, I think, share in that, that characteristic. How was that growing up, having, um, I don't even want to call it a disability, but just a difference 
in the way that you see the world, right? You gotta be more visual. Um, like how did that happen? Like how was that experience? Yeah, it's interesting. Again, you know, when you, I would, my, my parents found out when I was three years old that I had a hearing disability. And from that point on, I really didn't understand what that meant until I got fitted into my hearing aid. But even at that point, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what it meant until I was in second grade. And we played over, my dad played overseas when I was in first grade, we played, we were in Italy, moved back to Abilene, Texas when I was in second grade. And that was the first time in my life that I got made fun of. And that I realized that I was different than everybody else. And people were asking questions about the way that I talked and the hearing aids and why do you look like that? Why do you talk like that? My brother on the flip side, he was, he's always played sports. I think it, it, in my opinion, it might be different for boys. For girls, like we're trying to fit in and you know, we're trying that, that whole, I don't want to say experience, but trying to, that journey to find yourself. When those times did get tough, when you did realize like maybe I was different, how did you get through those negative moments and um, who helped you get back on that positive path? Well, my faith is a big part of who I am. And so first and foremost, everything, like all glory to God. Secondly, my family. My family's amazing. And those days when I'm like, you know, even, I mean, transition, like as we're transitioning in life, remember even making the decision like, hey guys, I called a, t a family meeting and was like, hey, I'm gonna retire in two years. 2014, I remember, I'm like, I need everybody to get on the phone. Got on a little conference call and it's like, hey, I'm gonna retire in two years. Do you know how good of a player you have to be to say, I'm gonna retire in two years? <laughs> like, like, I'm like listening to the conversation like, like what? Are oh, you gonna take when you gonna retire? Oh, you decide oh, when you retire. You, okay. oh, really? you stay like, healthy. You gotta like, stay I wish healthy. I had that. Like she could tell him, man, like two years from now, I'm cutting it. Yeah. Like, all right, no, that's I mean that's a blessing. Yeah, it is a blessing. You've been blessed. I mean, as I think about that and I feel how blessed you are, I, I look around here, I see the influence your mom has on you, the influence Pat had on you. Had to be special to have you know strong women in your life like this. Oh man my sister, you know, just strong women that have been around me, strong women that have supported me and continue. But there have been strong men too, you know, and, and I'm thankful that I had both. I had a father, even though my mom and dad were divorced, that valued our relationship enough that even to this day, tells me how beautiful I am. Oh, I love it. You know, and God, I want to start crying. Like, <laughs> um, knowing that no matter what, he loves me. No matter what, he wants to see me succeed. You know, strong women, strong men, just having a great amount of people in my life. Before beginning her legendary WNBA career, Tamika Katchings attended the University of Tennessee, where she won a national championship for the Lady Vols while receiving a few National Player of the Year awards in the process. In 2001, Tamika Catching was drafted third overall by the Indiana Fever, and she wound up spending her entire career in the Midwest. Due to an ACL tear suffered her senior year at Tennessee, Tamika missed her first season with the Fever. But like any other champion, she came back with a vengeance in 2002, where she won WNBA Rookie of the Year. Even after her basketball career in Indianapolis, Tamika has planted some roots in the city while making lasting relationships around the community. You go from Duncanville to Tennessee, and you're left in the hands of Pat Summit, the great Pat Summit. Explain that relationship from the moment you stepped foot on campus until you went into WNBA. I saw Pat when I was in eighth grade. Mm. And I remember I was flipping through channels, it stopped on a pair of eyes, just like glaring at the screen. And then the, it panned out and all I saw was orange. And I watched her stomp up and down the sideline. And I was like, man, if I could ever get good enough, I think I want to play for her. Wow. Crazy lady. <laughs> Fast forward, I got my first letter from Tennessee when I was a sophomore. Pat came on a visit in between junior and senior year. So when Pat came, I was like, we went to church. I fell asleep at church. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember. But then I committed to Tennessee. Best decision of my life. Wow. To go to Tennessee. 
not just because of basketball. You know, one of the things that I knew about Pat, she was going to recruit the best, going to play against the best, and ultimately going to make me the best. She worked great in every single thing that she did. She always talked about, we're going to be great in the classroom, we're going to be great on the court, we're going to be great in the community, but at the end of the day, when you leave this campus, I want you to be a great asset to society. Mm. And that's really like, it's bigger than basketball. So obviously I'm at UBS. Um, I think we should dive into the fun stuff, your finances. Ooh. When you got to Indiana, what did you know about finances? I knew about the bank, and I'll be honest, I got here and I was like, okay, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna save all my money. I befriended one of our practice players and one day we were talking and he was just asking, yeah, I'm not trying to get in your business, but what do you do with your money? Like, what do you do with your paycheck? I'm like, oh, they go straight to the bank. And, mm -hmm. As he kept talking, he said, well, you don't know about stocks and bonds. And so really, the more we talked about it, he was just like, you know, you should think about it. So he represented me first. And then I kind of bounced around and ended up with an amazing young lady that has helped me the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, um, just saving my money and really put me in a position to own establishments like this. Absolutely. And more, hopefully. You know, I run the athlete entertainer segment at UBS. We also have a women's segment. And they're... One of their key slogans um, is uh, a slogan called Owning Your Worth. Mm. And it's geared around women taking their seat at the table, at the financial table. Why is it important for you to have that seat at the table where now you're an owner, you're an entrepreneur, and also your financial advisor is a woman and she's helping you also create your legacy. Why is that important? Well, when you see it, you can be it. And I think for me, like working with Surrender, she's been amazing because I've watched her grow in her organization too. And so I think for, for me, I do have a seat at the table mm -hmm. by being able to talk to her very candidly about how I feel. And there's times I get mad. <laughs> I get mad, we all get mad about certain decisions that need to be made. But then I, when I go back and think about it, I'm like, gosh, I'm so glad I didn't make that decision because now I'm set up to be able to afford this rather than spending my money then. Absolutely. Now I have to. You've been a player, you're, you've been a GM. What can we do and what can corporations do? And what can the WNBA do to raise the level of compensation that our most athletic, gifted basketball players in the world are, are not making enough money? How can we help that? Well, I think the biggest thing is support. You know, we've come a long way. I know it, it, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. We're celebrating Title IX, 50 years Title IX this year. It's a great accomplishment. But I've been a part of the PA. I was president of our Players Association pretty much my whole, my whole career. And when I start thinking about each CBA, each collective bargaining agreement that we had to go through, there were change made. Then I don't know if you read, but they just did a $50 million equity, uh, equity fund pledge that just happened a couple months ago. So, like, there's things that are happening. Mm -hmm. But I think it's about the support. Right, and then it feels like we shouldn't be having our world-class best athletes leaving the country to go own, earn extra dollars. Right, I, I, and I hope. Right. I hope down the road we get to that point. You talk about your, your learning process and getting through um, not only just professional athletes, but your businesses and you're still learning. What have you learned about yourself during this course? Mm. And from the finances aspect? Just everything. Just What's just the life? biggest lesson that you learned about Tamika? Patience. You know, I think as athletes, we want things. Like, I, I want it now. Like, I want to be successful now. And I want Tease Me to be the Starbucks for tea. But we've only been around for five years. We're not going to be where they are right. today. Right. But down the road, I want somebody else to be like, man, Whatever they're trying to do, I want to be like, tease me. And so, like, the patience factor for me has been something that I'm learning how to be patient and not get angry. I know, I get it. I tell, <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time, like, I'm an overnight success. I'm just not sure what night it happened. Yes. Like, I woke up one morning and it happened. My head was down and we worked. So I get it. Like, you want to have that, that success, but as an athlete, you know, like, you got to put the work in. And, and it seems like you, you're doing that.
Some may remember the Hall of Famer Tamika Catchings as one of the greatest basketball players to ever lace them up. Tamika Catchings has become the all-time leading playoff scorer in the history of the WNBA. Others may view her as a source of inspiration, a respected voice in the community, a community that has embraced her since her young adult years. It's time to discover how Tamika Catchings would like to be remembered. So we talked about you love giving advice to young adults, family members give you advice, you have some amazing mentors in your life, but your ecosystem is small. That kind of goes against starting a foundation. You started Catch the Star Foundation, which kind of now broadens your reach on people. Why'd you do that? So when we got here, and I say we, because my sister and I moved on, I told my ACL my senior year in college, so I didn't even get to finish. She was playing overseas, moved back to Knoxville, took care of me. Wow. Then we got drafted to the Indiana Fever, and so I was still hurt. And I remember asking our GM at the time, I said, can, you, can I just finish rehab in Knoxville? And she's like, nope, this is your new home. Mm -hmm. And so when I got up here, really, I had two choices. One, either be really angry that I was here, mm -hmm. or two, get out in the community. And so immediately, like I did two, I chose two. Get out, the first, one of the first events that we did through the Indiana Fever was a basketball camp around the corner from here at Riverside Family Center. And the guy that was uh, the park manager at the time, he came over and he was just like, you are awesome with kids. Have you ever thought about doing your own basketball camp? And he became my best friend. <laughs> we started the Catch the, well, we started the, the Catch the Star basketball camp that year. Just celebrated 20 years. Families came up, mom, dad, after the camp, were like, oh my gosh, my kids love your camp. It was awesome. Do you guys do anything else? Mm -hmm. Next year, we added a fitness clinic. So Taj and I sat down and was like, okay, we can't keep adding programs. And at this time, mm -hmm. I kept winning community assist awards. And I'm giving the money that I'm winning to all the other organizations, although we are running all these programs. Wow. And so in 2004, we started the Catch Stars Foundation. Mm -hmm. We provide programming for boys and girls ages 7 to 18 around fitness, literacy, and youth development. And I tell you, it's really about impacting the future generation. And I love it. I mean, you don't, you don't do anything half. No, like, no. You know, because in <laughs> 2000, 2015, ESPN gave you the first humanitarian award. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. It is awesome. And mind you, no offense to any of the other athletes, mm -hmm. but we're on WNBA salaries doing what we do. Right. I mean, I know you don't want to take a shot at any of the athletes, but, you know, shot taken. And... Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, but it, it's, it's true, though. It's, it, it is a great example for, for all of us, for our community to see that. And in America, a lot of our young women need to have great examples for that. If a young woman were to come up to you today, and I'm, and I'm thinking back to what we do at Own Your Worth, you know, what are some of the steps? He says, I want to be just like you. Like, what do I need to do? What would you Dream tell Dream big. Them? Dream big. And I always, I love acronym. So when I say, like, dream big, believe. Believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams and what you want to accomplish. Be inspired, but not just be inspired by somebody else. You are an inspiration automatically. Mm -hmm. And then my G is always like, I, I, I strive for greatness in every single thing that I do. And my staff, my team here knows, like, I want you to be great. If you're going to be mediocre, I don't want to be around you. You talked about having those outside factors that weigh into some of the jobs that you did. You're a public figure. You're GM of a, a major WNBA team, Hall of Famer, national championship. You're a WNBA champion and you dive into the Black Lives Matter movement. Can you go into the conversations that took place why you made that decision to be a vocal supporter? And you know, while I, I will be honest, I was one on the sideline at first, watching everything happen. So I'm not gonna say like immediately I jumped the, like, but the more the conversations were had and the more, I mean, we, you think about it, 2016, we were the ones, the W as a whole, the ladies mm -hmm. stepped up mm -hmm. and really talked about it. But it wasn't until 2020 
that people really started accepting. It wasn't until George Floyd got murdered, killed, mm -hmm. in daylight, and everybody's at home, and everybody's why It wasn't until then that people chose to watch, hey, you don't have a choice, but to watch it. Mm -hmm. But then, like, okay, we have to make a difference. We made a decision here at Tease Me that we wanted to do something. And so we started our Tease Me community conversation. In the month of June, every single Friday, we did a conversation just talking about race. But we will always finish our conversation with, okay, how do we create change? Right. My grandfather, my great-grandfather fought for equality. Mm -hmm. My grandfather fought for equality. My dad fought for it. My dad didn't think that I would be fighting for it. And I dang sure hope that my kids don't have to fight for it one day just because I didn't do my part. You know, when I, when I look at you and I think about your legacy, I think it's an amazing legacy. What does legacy mean to you? Impact. Legacy means impact. You know, you set records. Records are meant to be broken. And I don't think my legacy will be what I accomplished on the basketball court. I think my legacy will be all the things that we do in the community. I think my legacy will be the amount of kids that we've sent on scholarship to college, the amount of kids that come and get free backpack because their parents can't afford to send them to school with school supplies. Our legacy will be the kids that we get to feed that wouldn't be able to eat anywhere else. I mean, our legacy is instilling in these young men and women that they are beautiful and that they can dream big. Like, though, that's my legacy. And my legacy stems from Pat's legacy. My legacy stems from my parents' legacy and them deciding when we were young that we're gonna go and we're gonna feed the homeless and we're gonna give Christmas toys, our Christmas toys. You know, I didn't appreciate it when I was young, but we're gonna give our Christmas, I mean, that's my legacy. My le basketball, people will always remember. Mm -hmm. But what I think when people circle back and really think about, all right, who is Tamika catching? that it will, the basketball part will be so small, but it will be all these other things that we've been able to accomplish. And I'm like, that the impact that you want to leave. You, you brought up Pat. What would she say about your legacy? Would she be happy oh, yeah. where you She'd at? She'd be proud. She'd be proud. She'd be proud. She'd be proud. That's good. She's still here, though. Right here. She's with you. Mm-hmm. Love her. Well, listen, I want to thank you for your time. You are an amazing, amazing, person. Uh, you, you played basketball pretty decently, <laughs> but overall, as a person, you are an example for all of us, for our communities. We want to thank you for joining us on Long Game. Thank UBS for having us, having you here, too, at Tease Me. And um, I'll be back when I'm in Indy.